On June 24, 1947, Kenneth Arnold, a successful businessman flying his small plane near Washington's Mount Rainier, came upon a shocking sight, a group of large, incredibly fast objects shaped, as he later reported to a startled world, like saucers. From this time on, for want of a better term, all such flying objects, no matter what their shape, were popularly referred to as flying saucers. A more modern term would be UFOs, or unidentified flying objects. To our speaker this morning, the, the word UFO, or flying saucer, has been an important part of his life. Mr. James Mosley is universally recognized as America's most knowledgeable and articulate flying saucer authority. He has devoted the last 15 years to an examination and evaluation of the saucer mystique. Mr. Mosley has appeared on countless radio and television programs across the country, including the Alan Burke and Joe Pine shows. He is also a regular guest on the Long John Neville program in New York. In 1954, Mr. Mosley founded the Saucer and Unexplained Celestial Events Research Society, or commonly referred to as the Saucers. This society is dedicated to a serious, rational examination of the entire flying saucer mystery. Mr. Mosley graduated from Princeton University and has led a life of adventure and travel. He participated in a number of major ex expeditions to Africa and was literally attacked both by spear-throwing natives and rampaging herds of elephants. He has made several trips to Peru where he was engaged in the exciting and dangerous art of treasure hunting among Inca burial grounds. For several years, he exported pre-Columbian artifacts of tremendous value to the United States. But today, Jim Mosley's consuming interest is flying saucers. His one goal in life is to find out where they come from and exactly what their presence means to our world. And now it is my pleasure to introduce to you Mr. James Mosley. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. That's a very glowing introduction. That's the longest introduction I think I've had. Uh, I want to go back into uh, ancient history briefly and tracing uh, the history of these flying saucers because they don't begin with Kenneth Arnold at uh, all. They go many, many generations back. In fact, uh, the Bible is a source that many people quote uh, for early flying saucer sightings. I'm not much of a Bible reader, but I've come across uh, a few passages. The most uh, often quoted one is the first chapter of um, Ezekiel, where the prophet sees the wheel within the wheel and uh, beings of some sort on this craft, if it is a craft. And uh, all in all, it sounds just like one of these flying saucer stories that we might read in our newspapers today. You can't very well uh, draw the craft that's being described. It's a sort of an arch archaic description, but it sounds like it should be some sort of a physical craft. Well, whether this is true or not, at least we do know that flying saucers have been seen throughout the ages and throughout the Middle Ages particularly. <clears throat> in the year 956 AD in Ireland, there was a very interesting case. Uh, this was in a church. Some people were in early morning mass, and they heard a noise outside a clunk against the outside of the door as if some huge object had hit it. They went outside in a panic and they saw that a uh, anchor had embedded itself on the door, outside the door, and some sort of a chain or a rope was going up from the anchor. And there was a craft hovering in the sky about 200 feet above the uh, church. And they saw, in addition to that, even more startling, the, f the fact that a man or a being of some sort was coming down this rope not climbing like we would, but swimming, as if swimming through water. A very interesting description, as if this was not the medium that this uh, creature was used to moving through. In any case, the people uh, wanted to seize this man and kill him. They were so uh, upset by the incident, but the bishop of the church warned them against it, and uh, they let the man go. He was not, however, able to cut the anchor as he'd wanted to do, uh, finally, he went back up the rope into his craft, and some other being on the craft cut this rope 
and let the anchor free, and the craft was able to go on its way. And as a souvenir of this very peculiar visitation, the anchor was kept for many years in the church as a souvenir, as a, a way of remembering what had happened to them. Well, this, this story was found by a man named Charles Fort and published in a book a few years ago. Charles Fort is a name that you probably haven't heard of. He lived in the latter part of the 19th century and died in 1931. And he devoted his entire life to finding things that were embarrassing to science, <clears throat> things that the science of his day, or this day for that matter, could not explain. Not only things that we would now call flying saucer visitations, but also any weird thing that was unusual, such as uh, falling frogs and falling fish and red rain and uh, places where gravity doesn't quite work right, all kinds of unusual events which, although very rare, do occur and have been written up in newspapers and scientific magazines throughout the years. Well, Mr. Fort uh, must have gotten together in his lifetime several thousand of these cases and a few hundred of which would be what we now call flying saucers. Another interesting case from the year 1897, which Mr. Fort uh, dug up, this was in a small town in Kansas. A farmer named Alexander Hamilton, not the famous uh, Alexander Hamilton of American history, but one who, however, was well known and respected in his uh, local area. In fact, he was a former state uh, congressman in, uh, in Kansas at this time. And uh, he was about to go to bed one night, about 8 o'clock. He had with him in his farmhouse his uh, hired hand and his son. And uh, just as they were about to retire for the night, they heard a lot of noise in back. The farm animals were kicking up a fuss, and they went back to see what was going on out there. And they saw a uh, object about 300 feet long with a brightly lit undercarriage of some sort, and six creatures in the undercarriage who were human-like in form and who were speaking to each other in a language that they could not understand. Well, this object was very close to the ground, about 100 feet or so. It looked like it was about to land, but as the creature spotted the Mr. Hamilton and his friends, they sh uh, turned on a bright uh, searchlight beam and uh, went back up a little bit into the sky, moved outward and a few hundred feet away where there was a, a cow stuck in a fence. And it became evident that the interest of these creatures was in this cow. So again, the object started to come down toward the earth and a lasso at the end of a rope came out from the object they hooked this lasso somewhere uh, around the neck of the cow, and as strange as this seems, the cow, saucer and all, disappeared uh, slowly from view before the startled eyes of these people. Perhaps the first uh, instance of a, a cow napping in, uh, in history. But to make it even weirder, uh, two days later, Mr. Hamilton was on a neighboring farm a few miles from uh, where he lived, and he heard about a cow that had been found uh, just the skin and the head, but no uh, body, just uh, very, uh, most of it, you might say, had been uh, taken away. And when he looked at this carcass, what was left of it, he saw that it had his brand on it. And uh, apparently, uh, quite obviously, this was the same animal that had been stolen for whatever purposes we don't know by these uh, space creatures. Uh, this story, again, is believable mainly because it's uh, not only told by three people who saw everything involved, but uh, a sworn statement was made out at that time, which is still available to see, um, signed by about 12 of Mr. Hamilton's friends and neighbors who say that in spite of the unusual nature of the story, they know him from anywhere from one to 30 years and they believe him to be an honest person. Well, after Mr. Ford died in, th in 1931, there was a gap of time in which either there weren't so many of these strange events or perhaps just nobody around to uh, write them down for us. During the 30s, we don't have much about flying saucers, but in uh, World War II, the whole thing started up again. This time it was a little bit different, not big objects in the sky, but small ones. Uh, fuzzy balls, about two to three feet in diameter, were seen by our pilots in both theaters of war, in the European theater and in the Japanese theater during the latter part of 1944 and the first part of 1945. And in the typical case, these uh, objects would be seen in broad daylight, pacing our aircraft a uh, number of yards off the wingtip, 
Uh, moving forward a bit uh, at high speed, moving back from the plane, making right angle turns, and eventually coming back to the aircraft and uh, then speeding away and disappearing at very high speed uh, from view. There were several dozen of these cases. They were in the newspapers a few times during the war. Uh, we thought that it was some secret weapon of the Axis powers. It turned out after the war they thought it was some secret weapon of ours. But it was neither, and this became part of the overall flying saucer mystery because after the end of World War II, there were no more of these Foo Fighters, so we never found out what they were. In 1946, the year after the war, there was another one of these little mysteries within a mystery. This time it was in Sweden. Uh, these objects were again quite different. They were called the Swedish Ghost Rockets. They were seen just that one particular summer by hundreds of people in various parts of Sweden. They were always traveling from east to west at very high speed. They were large uh, cigar-shaped objects, usually traveling in a straight line, and the speeds uh, involved were in, in excess of 1,000 miles an hour, which was much faster than anything that we had on Earth at that time. Well, again, it was speculated perhaps this was some uh, experimentation of the uh, Russians because they were coming from the east, always east to west, but this was never proven or substantiated, and after that particular summer of 1946, there were no more Swedish ghost rockets. So again, we have a mystery within a mystery. Well, as indicated in the uh, introduction, the saucer mystery as we now know it began in 1947 with Mr. Arnold's sighting. Uh, he didn't exactly coin this term himself. It happened in a, a peculiar way. He was flying his plane in the state of Washington near Mount Rainier, when he saw this group of nine gleaming objects over the mountains at a good distance away. And he watched them for several seconds until they disappeared, and um, he saw that they were going about 12 to 1,500 miles per hour. And after he landed his plane, he talked to the press about the sighting, and was asked, well, what do these objects look like? And he said, well, they look like saucers skimming over water. That's all he said. But the press, always anxious to make up a glib term to describe something new or something that they don't understand, invented for Mr. Arnold the term flying saucer, which for better or worse we are stuck with till this very time. UFO or unidentified flying object is the more common term or the more dignified term, the term that's used by the Air Force. Well, I want to give you uh, just a few more examples of uh, high points in the history or the recent history of saucers before I show this little film that I have. Un um, beside the Arnold sighting, another very exciting uh, incident from the 1940s was one that happened in January of 1948. This is a, a classic case that's been rewritten and rehashed many times in the flying saucer literature of the past few years. This was the story of a, a Captain Thomas Mantell Captain Mantell was a fighter pilot attached to Goodman Air Force Base in the state of Kentucky. One afternoon, he was coming into the base. There were two other fighter pilots coming in at the same time, and they were asked by the control tower to investigate a very large uh, cigar-shaped object which was hovering at high altitude over the field. This same object, incidentally, had been seen in various parts of the state of Kentucky earlier in the afternoon by uh, various people on the ground and had also been seen on... Uh, the uh, radar scope in uh, uh, one or two of the of the airports in that area. Well, uh, this Captain Mantell and the other two pilots went up chasing this thing. The other two turned back at 15,000 feet because they had no oxygen in the planes at that time, or this particular type of plane. And Captain Mantell, however, because he was more excited or more uh, determined, he uh, radioed the uh, control tower and said, I'll go to 20,000 feet, and if I can't reach it, I'll turn back. Well, he did indeed turn back, but in a most uh, peculiar way. His, uh, his plane was later found scattered over a very wide area. His body was mutilated to such an extent that uh, the pictures of it could never be shown to his, um, uh, to his family. And the uh, question arose, obviously, as to just how he had died. Well, some people speculated that he had been uh, blown up uh, by getting too close to the supposed f uh, force field around this flying saucer, or even that he had been blown up purposely by the occupants thereof. We certainly don't know to this day how he died, just what happened, but we do know for sure only one thing, 
The Air Force, in their usual uh, way, came into the situation and tried to solve the case uh, prematurely by stating that uh, Captain Mantell had been chasing the planet Venus. But if it were Venus, and uh, this object had been seen on radar, uh, we can assume that we're in very bad shape if a uh, radar, which only goes to maybe 20, 30 miles up, uh, will locate for us the planet Venus. So uh, this was an ex a prime example, and there are many, many others of the Air Force putting their foot in their mouth with one of these uh, answers to an unsolved case. In 1952, we had a uh, real flap, as we call it, uh, which is a concentration of sightings over the whole world. We use that term FLAP. Uh, it's, an, it's another coined term, uh, which simply means a concentration of sightings uh, during a small period of time or over a relatively small area. And for some reason, which we uh, know nothing about, uh, the month of July 1952, saw more of these saucer sightings in that one month than usually occurs in an entire year. In that month alone, about 1,500 cases were uh, sent into the U.S. Air Force, and probably several thousand were not. And of all of them, perhaps the most interesting was one that happened in Washington, D.C., at the Washington National Airport. At that airport and the two military airports near Washington, uh, they suddenly saw one evening, one Sunday evening in July 52, a group of uh, eight to ten unknown objects on the radar scope, very plainly, moving on and off the, sco uh, off the scope, uh, traveling at high speeds, and doing all the things that uh, these UFOs can do, but which normal aircraft cannot do. Well, they watched these for a period of about a half hour. They were quite startled and upset about it, because obviously Washington especially is a very sensitive area. They can't have unknown craft flying over it. So uh, from one of the military airports near Washington, they sent up a group of jets to investigate. And as these jets moved in over Washington, of course, they too could be seen on the radar scope. But as they came in, the objects, whatever they were, moved off from the scope and disappeared. Again, when the jets went back to their base a few minutes later, the unknowns came back and for another half hour or so moved about in the same way as before, traveling at high speeds in the thousands of miles per hour, uh, making right angle turns and so forth. And the significance here is not only the fact that the uh, objects uh, displayed obviously uh, intelligent control and that they left when they were being chased, but also the fact that this was a simultaneous radar and visual sighting, which uh, eliminates the possibility completely that this could have been some uh, malfunction of the radar set. The same thing that was seen from the ground was seen from the air and was seen on the radar scope. Well, again, briefly, another one of these uh, sighting flaps that we had was in um, 1957. Each of these flaps is a little bit different. In 57, uh, you might remember that the Russians sent up their first Sputnik in uh, November of that year. And within a week, for whatever reason, whether it had something to do with Sputnik or not, again, we don't know, but a, a great amount of these uh, saucer sightings started to occur in one particular part of the country, and this was Texas, Arizona, and New Mexico, especially in Texas. We had several cases, probably three or four dozen altogether within that one week, in which motorists who were driving alone late at night on these roads out there would see a uh, UFO, usually a, uh, a sort of an egg-shaped craft, uh, 50 feet in diameter approximately, hovering near the ground or moving at low speed near the ground, and uh, as these objects were in view, the interesting thing was that the engine on the car would cease functioning and the uh, windshield wipers, the radio, or anything that operated off the battery would cease functioning just during the period of time that the UFO was nearby. And in the typical case, the object, after having hovered or even landed for a few seconds or a couple of minutes, would then move slowly out of sight and disappear. And once the object was gone, of course, then the car would operate normally again. Well, this is sort of a um, electromagnetic side effect of some sort involved with these flying saucers. Uh, sometimes these side effects occur and sometimes they don't. There have been other cases, by the way, in which uh, saucers have been seen in neighborhoods of uh, cities, the residential neighborhoods, and during the time that the object was in view, the lights, uh, the power in the whole area would go off. And again, when the object disappeared, the lights would go on again. 
Also, interference of the same sort with radio and TV in private homes. There are hundreds of cases of this that have been well documented. Well, there's one last uh, thing I would mention before showing the film, and this is the flap which is best known, I think, to everybody. Uh, you would have read it if you've read any of the recent literature on the subject. This was the uh, Exeter flap ex in Exeter, New Hampshire. It was made into a, a best-selling book by a man named John Fuller. It started with a uh, story that just happened to get on the wire service. This was in uh, September of 1965. A young man named Norman Muscarello was hitchhiking on a lonely road uh, near Exeter about midnight one night when he, uh, as happened so often in these cases, he heard some farm animals making noise. He looked over. There was this farm across the highway from him about 100 yards away, and he saw this object about 50, 60 feet in diameter, uh, saucer-shaped, brightly lit with peculiar uh, lighting effects, lights that sort of flashed on and off at intervals, and a spotlight also on it. And this object was coming toward him, making a humming sound and uh, at an altitude of not more than 100 to 150 feet off of the ground. Well, he was quite frightened because it was coming directly at him, and he thought it might hit him. Uh, so he hid behind some bushes until finally the object, very slowly moving, went on by him and out of sight. Well, after the object was gone, he got back on the highway and got a ride into town finally. Uh, spoke to law enforcement officers there about what he had seen, and they, seeing obviously that he was at least very uh, genuinely shook up by something, they sent two uh, patrol cars back out to the same spot. Uh, Mr. Muscarello rode in one of the cars, and when they got out there, there were these two officers and uh, this uh, young man. They uh, waited for about uh, 20, 25 minutes at the same spot where this thing had been seen before, and eventually the object came back. Now, this is the interesting part, because so often uh, these areas are, are checked over by uh, law enforcement officers after a sighting has been made, and of course the object is gone, there's nothing to see. But in this case, the identical object, or a very similar one, came back uh, following the same pattern as the first one had, and was so uh, close to the ground and uh, so frightening again to these people that one of the officers drew his gun and wanted to shoot at it which might have been a bad idea. This has happened sometime that people have uh, actually tried to shoot at these objects or have shot at them. In any case, uh, the uh, sighting was confirmed by all the people present there. The story got on the wire service after that, and uh, a uh, well-known writer in New York named John Fuller heard about this, was sent up by his magazine to investigate. And when he got up to uh, Exeter, New Hampshire, he found out that there wasn't just this one case at all. There was really a great number of similar things that were going on in the Exeter area. Sixty to seventy people in uh, that small part of New Hampshire had been seeing over the past several weeks similar objects very near the ground, hovering, humming, buzzing the ground, and so on. But the interesting uh, part of this was that almost all the sightings were made in the close vicinity of high-tension power lines. Uh, this, again, is something we don't understand the reason behind. It might be that the objects are getting power from the lines or giving something to the lines. There was even one case in which there was a uh, tube, a metal tube of some sort, that was seen jutting out from the saucer, about a 10-foot long uh, projection, which was almost touching a power line, as if something was being taken from the line. Well, this was a consistent factor, as I say, throughout most of these sightings, and uh, the group of sightings as a whole became the subject of this book, which, oh, a year and a half or so ago was a bestseller by this man, John Fuller. I think at this point I have quite a lot of other material about the little men that have been seen inside of these saucers, but at this point I think I'll show the film with a little bit of background on it. Uh, there have been many, many still pictures of flying saucers throughout the years, and uh, I don't try to show any because they don't really prove anything. If you have even one friend, and hopefully everybody has one friend at least, you simply have him uh, throw up an object, a pie plate or a garbage lid or whatever you prefer, and uh, snap the picture as the thing is in the air, and you've got a picture that's as good as any of the supposedly genuine ones are. But over the years that have, have been, maybe... Uh, six or eight motion picture films also. And these are considerably harder to fake. You'd need a lot of time and money, and amateurs wouldn't normally uh, 
have it or uh, go into that much uh, uh, trouble to uh, fake something. So I tend to think that the picture you're about to see is genuine. There have been two other uh, short film clips of flying saucers which have been incorporated into a documentary movie called UFO that came out about 10 years ago. In New York City, we still see this movie on late, late television occasionally. I don't know if it's been out here or, or not. But uh, when you see this film, don't expect too much. It's just a uh, amateur shot. Um, it runs, though, less than a minute. And uh, the background of this particular film is as follows. A, a young fellow named John Sheets, whose head bobs in and out of the film, as you'll see, was uh, driving in a uh, very desolate part of West Virginia with his boss. They were in the roofing business. They were on their way one afternoon to take motion pictures of a little league ball game. That's why they had the 16-millimeter camera in the car. As they were driving, uh, this area was known as Lost Creek, West Virginia. It's near Clarksburg in the western part of the state. As they were driving along about 3 p.m., they saw this object, which they claimed was 12 to 15 feet in diameter, start to follow their car at a distance of about uh, 100, 150 feet off the ground. They uh, wanted to take pictures of it, so they stopped the car, but by the time they got the camera loaded, the object had left. Well, in, as in the other case that I told you about a moment ago, the object did finally come back a second time, which is unusual, and by that time they were more or less ready for it. But again, you'll see in the film, the first few feet are wasted as the man is desperately trying to get lined up in the viewfinder the object which he is seeing uh, visually. So really, you only see the object for about 30 seconds. And that's the story behind it. So I, I think we'll show the film now. We'll try to show it once forward, but it's so brief that we'll then show it backward. It doesn't really make much difference, as you'll see. Well, I'm the only one that can't see it, so I guess it did go through all right. Sometimes we have a little trouble, like the sprockets get uh, broken on the film, and it uh, has some trouble going through, but at least we got it very good this time. Well, in the time that's left, I want to tell you a little bit about the little men stories, uh, the landing stories. These are the wilder ones, and uh, these are often called little green men, which is the one term that I don't like. I have a sense of humor on this subject, as I think you have to have. But uh, there just haven't been any little green men seen. Uh, if I have nothing against the color green, but uh, if it were to occur, but it happens that these creatures have been the normal range of human skin colors, although they are different from us in some other ways that I'll, I'll get to in a moment. Well, these stories of landings of little men seem to go back to about 1950. At that time, there was a book that came out by a uh, Hollywood columnist named uh, Frank Scully, and he wrote this book that was supposed to be quite serious and was taken seriously. In it, he alleged that during the year 1949 and the early part of 1950, there had been four crashes of flying saucers in the southwestern states of this country, and that in each of these crashes, not only had the saucer been found, or the disc, but also the dead bodies of 10 to uh, 20 little men, uh, humanoid creatures looking about like us, but much shorter, three and a half to four feet tall. This was the story that Frank Scully told. He claimed that in each of these cases, the government had been able to get to the spot in time before anyone else did, and sealed off the area, took away the saucer and the bodies before anyone else could see them, and that these bodies and these saucers were being kept by the government 
in the place where they have the center of their flying saucer investigation, which is Wright-Patterson Field in Dayton, Ohio. Well, no one was ever able to prove this one way or the other. Uh, there were some rumors in the early 50s, and this was when I first got started in my saucer investigation. Uh, many people were claiming to know someone else that was always sort of secondhand who might have been driving along a road at that time in the southwest and saw the road blocked off and military guards there or something of that sort, or in other cases, people who were driving along and saw a uh, army truck go by with a... Um, the canopy on it was some sort of a circular object apparently under the canopy. Well, whether these things happened or not, I, as I say, I could never get to the bottom of. But uh, again, whether Frank Scully was right or whether he maybe was pulling people's legs, the fact of the matter was that beginning just after that and having nothing to do with his story, stories of live little men started to uh, crop up, not only in this country but all over the world. And to date, there must be two or three hundred of these stories. Most of them are from overseas. I'd say the uh, majority of them are from South America, from uh, Argentina, or Brazil, or Peru, Ecuador, and a couple of other countries down there. Also, uh, a great number of them have come from Western Europe, especially France, a few from Italy and from England, and as far away as Australia and New Zealand. But uh, there have been maybe two dozen that have come from Canada and from the U.S., and of those, I'm going to uh, pick one or two to tell you about, which I think are particularly interesting, that have happened right in this country. The first one has its ludicrous uh, angle to it, as you'll see, but I pick it because it involves not just one or two witnesses, like most of these stories do, but a group of 11 witnesses. Eight adults and three children, as a matter of fact, in a farming family again. This was in the state of Kentucky. Now, you'll have to realize beforehand that in Kentucky, they're apparently very well armed in their farms. Uh, one evening in the year 1955, this family was in their house about 8 p.m. They heard the dog barking very loud. They went out to investigate. Two of them went out, and they saw that a uh, craft had landed, some sort of a brightly lit, lit uh, circular object had landed about 100 yards behind the farmhouse. But uh, worse than that, there was a small creature that was advancing toward the farmhouse and was uh, about 15 yards from it when they went out. Now, this creature was described as being about four feet tall and looking about like an animal might, as far as the fact that it had claws instead of uh, fingers and uh, claws instead of toes. And it also had some sort of a luminous costume on. It was shining very brightly in the dark. Now, this description matches some of the other ones made in similar uh, cases, and some of the other ones, however, are a little bit different, as I'll get into. Anyway, this was what this particular creature looked like, sort of like a monkey or an animal more than a human, but generally humanoid in its appearance. So they took two shots at this thing uh, with the rifle and with a, uh, a pistol. Uh, they shot at it from a distance of about 15 yards and saw that it... Uh, uh, seemed to uh, fall over as if it was hit, but yet it was not harmed, as a human would obviously be. After falling over, it uh, hopped up and scurried off into the bushes as if it were not hurt at all. Well, this frightened them even more. So they uh, went into their farmhouse, and they uh, locked the door and turned out the lights and waited to see what might happen next. And over the next hour, a few other things did happen, one of which was a similar uh, small creature, uh, apparently attached itself to the screen on uh, the outside of uh, one of the windows and started to peer into the house. And here they described it as a creature with slant eyes of some kind and a uh, helmet-like thing over his head. Well, when they saw this face in the window, they blasted at it uh, from inside the farmhouse, right, right through the window, and uh, again they seemed to hit it, but the thing fell away and seemed to run off again as if unharmed. Well, this sort of thing went on for over an hour. They were in a state of siege, more or less, in this house. And about uh, 10 o'clock that night, after things had subsided a bit, uh, the whole family jumped into two uh, automobiles they had and went to the local uh, law enforcement officers, the local sheriff's office, I believe, came back uh, with the uh, officers, a whole carload of them, uh, and uh, went on investigating as to see if anything was left. Well, the saucer was gone when the officers arrived, and uh, the only thing that they saw was a burned area in back of the farmhouse where this craft had apparently landed, and, of course, the obvious evidences of the struggle, the empty shotgun shells uh, 
and so forth, showing that indeed these people, whatever the reason may have been, the least you can say is that they had something happen to them so frightening that they uh, fired, it was uh, altogether about 50 rounds of ammunition in, in and near their own house. So uh, if it happened uh, to you, I think perhaps you'd do the same. Who, who knows? It, it would be a very frightening experience. Well, another incident which involves only one close witness, but which is far better known, uh, this occurred in Socorro, New Mexico in the year 1964. This was carried on the wire surface at the time and was quite uh, much talked about for a week or so afterwards. A um, um, highway patrolman named Lonnie Zamora, who worked in the town of uh, Socorro, New Mexico, was chasing a speeder down a highway a mile or so from town when he saw, uh, this is again broad daylight, uh, he saw that there was a, a circular object that was hovering near a dynamite shack a couple of miles off to one side of the highway. And his first thought wasn't about flying saucers at all, it was the fact that this uh, craft might uh, crash into the shack and blow up. So uh, he let the speeder go and he took a side road that led right to this uh, shack or near it. And as he got uh, nearer to the object, the, the noise from this uh, UFO got louder and louder and uh, frightened him uh, considerably. And this was the one unusual aspect of the case. Usually these objects are very silent or make just a low humming sound. This one was very loud indeed. Well, he stopped his car about uh, 50 or 100 yards from the object, which by this time had landed on the desert floor, not directly, but was standing on uh, three long, thin metal legs, which came out from the bottom of the craft and which stood on the desert. And next to the craft, uh, apparently tinkering with the craft, maybe fixing something or looking it over, were two small creatures, four feet or so in height, and uh, these uh, were seen very clearly by Lonnie Zamora and were said to have uh, on a coverall of some sort over their body, some sort of a costume. And uh, as he watched them, uh, one of the creatures saw him watching, and the two of them, as happens typically in many of these cases, uh, became frightened, they scurried into their craft very hurriedly, got into it, and the craft took off at high speed uh, in a, a horizontal way and disappeared from view in a matter of seconds. Well, this same thing, by the way, was seen by other people, but at a much greater distance. The case got so uh, much uh, attention because of being carried on the wire service that uh, for once the Air Force had to try to do something about it. Now, I should explain, the Air Force has a saucer investigation and has had since 1947, but they try to do the least possible. They try to hope that the public will uh, not uh, pay too much attention to these things, but uh, this time they had to send out somebody to the spot to investigate. And the man they chose was the man they usually choose, their chief uh, scientific uh, consultant, a man named Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who is an astronomer at uh, Dearborn Observatory and in, a, in his spare time works for the Air Force. Well, he came out to uh, Socorro and uh, spoke, of course, to Lonnie Zamora and uh, saw, incidentally, that there was on the desert at the spot where this thing had landed a very definite charred area. And uh, his conclusion on this was that it was a genuine unknown. It was something that he could not solve. In other words, uh, all the uh, evidence was there, the material was there, the witnesses and so forth, but in spite of all efforts, there was no uh, conventional answer to this particular case, and so it's carried still in the Air Force records, an unknown sighting. Well, the last instance of this kind I'd like to mention is the one that you're most likely of all to have heard of, because this was uh, serialized in Look Magazine and became also the subject of a second best-selling best book by the same man I mentioned before, John Fuller. How many people have heard of uh, the Hills, the uh, couple from New Hampshire who uh, had this weird experience? About half or a third, yeah. Well, this particular case is different from all the others in some uh, ways, but I mention it simply because it uh, brings us into an entirely new area, because these people claim to have been aboard the craft, actually. The Hills were vacationing in 1961 in uh, Canada, and uh, they lived in New Hampshire, not far from Exeter, where these other things had happened by the way, and as they were coming back from their vacation, driving late at night through uh, the mountainous country of New Hampshire, 
they saw a uh, flying saucer type of object that landed near the highway. And uh, after this happened, they drove for over 30 miles, a distance of 30 miles or so, and a period of time of over one hour, which they later realized they had no recollection of. Their mind, their, their memory had been blotted out somehow for this period of time. They did not know how they traveled that distance or how they spent that hour. This bothered them a great deal, as it would bother anybody if you have a missing period of time, unless you've been drinking heavily, and they had not. And uh, so they uh, had bad dreams about it. They talked to each other, of course, a great deal about it over a period of months. And finally, they decided to go to a very well-known Boston psychiatrist who, through uh, a hypnosis, took them back over this missing period of time, a tape recording a great number of sessions individually with this uh, couple, Betty and Barney Hill. And uh, after several months of this, it became evident that the stories told... Uh, by each was pretty much the same, and the missing period of time in their lives involved the fact that they had been aboard this craft. Not only had they been aboard, but they had been uh, speaking with the crew. Again, it was people a little shorter than us, but looking quite a lot like we do, and they had even been physically examined aboard the craft. So uh, this story, of course, was uh, quite sensational. It was told by two people, almost identically. If it were one person, it would be pretty hard to believe, perhaps. Well, the, the point is, of course, was this a, a subjective experience of theirs, or was it real, or was it something that they made up? Well, you cannot lie under a hypnosis, uh, supposedly. You tell at least what you, you believe to be true. And uh, knowing this, uh, this couple slightly, as I do, I would uh, also say, from my knowledge, that they're not lying. They're quite sincere in what they say. Whether or not it is a subjective experience or a objectively real one is something that I think the future will have to determine. Uh, I would uh, be more willing to believe the case if there were others like it. On the other hand, as I say, the two people telling the same story does give it a lot of weight. Well, in a, a closing, I'd like to mention why it is, I think, that the saucer subject has become more interesting to the general public or better known uh, in the last two years than at any time in the past before that. And that's because of one particular sighting, which, again, most people have heard of, the famous marsh gas cases up in uh, Michigan. Well, on the 20th of March of 1966, in Dexter, Michigan, there was a sighting that was seen by uh, several uh, police cars, uh, about 50 other residents of the area. This was an object which was hovering near a swamp and was uh, diving toward the ground and making various uh, strange motions in the sky, again, different from an ordinary aircraft. It was seen close enough by some people to determine the shape, and it had a definite football shape. It was about 12 feet in diameter. It had a um, appendage sticking out from the top. Uh, this was drawn later for the newspapers by the man that saw it quite uh, close and uh, uh, quite clearly. Uh, this story got on the wire surface uh, on the AP, and uh, Two nights later, a few miles from there, at a uh, girls' dormitory at Hillsdale College in Michigan, uh, there was a sighting made by about 75 of these girls who uh, hung out their windows for over an hour one evening watching this same object or a similar one, which was hovering over an artificial lake near the college. And the object was seen not only by the girls in the dormitory, but by several of the instructors and by the CD director of that area and so forth. Again, these girls were later asked for Life magazine and others to draw pictures of what they'd seen, and these objects which they drew turned out to be very similar one to another and the, to the one drawing that had been made earlier by this man in the first case two days before. So these were definitely solid objects uh, with a definite structure and a definite shape. This was determined not only by these sightings but by several others which did not get on the wire service, as these two did. Well, again, uh, there was so much fuss going on that the Air Force felt they had to investigate. They sent the same man, Dr. J. Allen Hynek, who I mentioned uh, went to Socorro. He came. He was under a great deal of pressure from the Air Force and the public and the press to investigate uh, quickly and come up with an answer. And he did so. He didn't have enough time to talk to everybody. He did not investigate all of the cases, but he did do what he could in the time that he had. And he had a press conference thereafter and said that these sightings were caused by swamp gas or marsh gas. And, of course, this was just contrary to the facts. Well, in previous cases of the same nature where there have been sightings and where the Air Force has come along and put them down, so to speak, 
Uh, then the public sort of goes back to sleep and forgets about it. They tend to accept what their government tells them. But in this case, it had the opposite um, effect in that uh, people, having read so recently about these cases, uh, could see clearly that whatever it was, it couldn't be marsh gas. So the public uh, interest swelled more than ever. Um, there were uh, people asking for a congressional investigation. There were thousands of people writing into the Air Force and so forth. And ever since then, as a matter of fact, we've had this wave of uh, interest, which has been expressed in maybe two dozen books that have come out in the last two years, and TV specials and magazine articles and so forth and so on. So uh, I think it is, as I say, uh, directly because of the sightings in, in Michigan. But the interesting thing is that Dr. J. Allen Hynek did not uh, mean to say what he was uh, said to have said about these sightings. In the December 17th issue of uh, Saturday Evening Post, uh, that was in 66, December 17th, uh, Dr. Hynek wrote an article in which he uh, stated that he had been misquoted. Uh, he had said probably marsh gas or possibly rather than making a definite statement. And in addition to that, he stated clearly in writing in the Saturday Evening Post that in his personal opinion, the uh, saucers are either some unknown uh, natural phenomenon, which is completely beyond our present science and our present knowledge and understanding, or if not that, then they actually are objects from some other planet. Now, once again, the man stating this is the uh, chief scientific consultant to the U.S. Air Force, the man who has been involved in the saucer mystery for uh, about 20 years. So uh, if he goes that far, I can at least go a little bit further because I have no scientific reputation to lose. And uh, I would say that um, these objects are definitely uh, controlled uh, intelligently. I think that these uh, stories that I've been telling you about, at least most of them, are involved with these small humanoids that have been seen in the objects. I think these are true stories for the most part and that they uh, mean that we're being watched, obviously, by intelligences from somewhere. The next uh, thing would be from where? Well, we don't know. They could very possibly be from an unknown part of our own uh, Earth. There are many parts of uh, this planet itself which have not been fully explored. Most people don't realize that. I have lived in South America to some extent, and I know that huge areas of Brazil and other countries have never even been flown over from the air. Uh, theoretically, there could be almost anything in some of these very dense jungles that exist down there. More likely, I think, uh, these uh, objects come from some nearby planet, I don't think they come from uh, a different uh, star system. I think that they're a permanent part of the Earth's environment. They're seen here frequently. They're seen here almost daily somewhere. These saucer flaps or these peaks of sightings that I was talking about seem to be artificial. If you find, uh, if you have uh, access rather to all the information, you find that these sightings are going on somewhere almost all the time. So I assume that perhaps Mars would be a good guess. Uh, Mars is supposed to have a uh, climate somewhat, but not very much, like ours here on Earth. I think that if it isn't Mars, it's somewhere else not too far away, and at least as we go out into space ourselves in the next uh, few years, we will find out more and more about where these things don't come from, and hopefully we'll find out sooner or later where they do come from. Now, what I'm going to do, I think I'm going to take about five minutes for uh, questions and answers between now and... Uh, 10.30, and then those that want to stay later, and I think you have time up till about a quarter of 11, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll take a break at 10.30, and then uh, anyone that wants to ask anything further after that, I'll be glad to stay as long as you want me to. So I'm sure I've raised some uh, questions, doubts, or comments in your minds uh, with what I've said so far. Let's see what we can come up with. Yes. Oh, about the, about the horse in Colorado, yeah. This uh, was last September. Briefly, the story was that this horse, Snippy, was found dead uh, rather mysteriously. No one saw the death. That was the main problem there. There had been saucer sighting in the area, including that day and previous days, but there was nobody who saw the horse die or saw a saucer there when the horse died. But the uh, circumstances of the death were as follows. They found that the... Uh, Skin had been cut off from the neck up, which is r rather peculiar. From the neck down, it was still intact. The brain cavity was empty. There were uh, marks on the uh, desert uh, near there, 
uh, I believe, uh, geometrical marks and holes in the ground and so forth. And also um, radioactivity was found to be quite high, not at the uh, body itself, but near the body of the horse. And uh, the reason they tied it in with saucers, of course, is the um, supposition based on the type of story I mentioned earlier that uh, these uh, space creatures are interested in experimentation or kidnapping of uh, humans and animals and so forth. There have been many similar cases, but I don't think that this particular one is a, is a good one. I don't think it's uh, possible to definitely tie in flying saucers. I think it's just a, a supposition that people have made. Now, uh, one final thing on that. There's an uh, investigation sponsored and financed by the Air Force, which uh, centers at uh, Colorado University. It's, uh, it's headed by a man named Dr. Uh, Edward U. Uh, Condon, who is a well-known physicist. And they've been given about a half a million dollars for a two-year study of flying saucers. Well, the Condon people, just like everyone else, didn't hear of this uh, Colorado horse incident until about two weeks after the horse died. They sent out a, a veterinarian at that point, but I'm sure there wasn't much to find but a rather messy horse. So uh, Condon uh, concluded that the death was from natural causes because there had been some infection in the horse's flank also, but I don't think you can say that it was natural causes any more than you can say it was flying saucers. I, I would leave it just as an unknown, as a, as a mystery myself. All right. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good point. Why don't the saucers uh, cause sonic booms when they break the sound barrier? Well, I can't answer that except just to say that they don't. I mean, there is apparently, and this is a speculation that has been put out by various technicians who know more about this assumedly than I do, but uh, they speculate that the field around a saucer, this anti-magnetic field or anti-gravity field, whatever it may be, uh, is such that uh, it uh, causes the air not to touch the saucer as it moves through the air in the same way that it would touch an aircraft and that for that reason somehow, because it's separated from the air as it goes through the air, it does not have the sonic boom that an aircraft would have. This is pure speculation. All you can say is that these speeds are uh, seen, that these objects are m moving at these speeds, at these altitudes, and what beyond that is pure theory as to how and why they do it or what causes it to be done. Yes. Observatories, you mean, uh, well, the big telescopes usually are not uh, tuned into something that's happening this, this close to the Earth, but there are many cases of um, astronomers, reputable astronomers, who have seen UFOs, not so often through the telescope, but usually just on their own. Uh, one, uh, one such case was in 1940. Uh, Eight, uh, 49, as a Dr. Clyde Tom Bow, who uh, very briefly is one of our most famous astronomers. He discovered the planet Pluto in 1931, and he was at his own home one evening in Las Cruces, New Mexico, when he saw one of these uh, cigar-shaped objects fly over at a very low altitude, maybe 200 feet over his uh, backyard, and uh, he told the press and Life magazine and so forth about it thereafter. There are many such cases. Uh, involving uh, astronomers, pilots, and uh, people of uh, all degrees of education and, and competence. Uh, but naturally, because there are thousands of sightings, the, the majority of them are made by just average citizens. I think we'll take one, one more question, and then we'll break, and those who want to stay on are welcome to do so. One more question before we break. Yeah. Have I made any actual sightings myself? <clears throat> yes, I've, I've seen a couple of uh, things. Nothing, however, as spectacular as these cases I've been talking about here. My interest is a intellectual curiosity and not based on what I've uh, seen personally. One thing I did see, uh, briefly described, was a uh, Earth uh, satellite type of object moving in a straight line, a very high speed, a very high altitude, back in 1953. And uh, except for the speed involved, it wouldn't have been uh, very exciting at all where it's seen now. It would be just a, a satellite, of which we have so many. But there were no satellites until 1957. So I was four years ahead of my time in seeing this thing. And I, all I know is it was a UFO, like these other things are UFOs, but there was no uh, 
ability to see detail because of the great height involved. I've seen a couple of other things too, but nothing spectacular. I, I go more by what I read and what I hear from talking to other people and interviewing people and investigating these cases when I have the chance to do so. Well, I thank you very much for your uh, kind attention, and, uh, and I'll uh, be glad to talk to whoever wants to stay. Thank you.